Of course, this is our Missions and Evangelism Week, and uh, uh, it started off wonderfully yesterday. Uh, uh, we have uh, Afshin Ziafat back with us. Uh, he was here uh, seven years ago for our World Evangelism Conference, did a great job, very compelling, convicting, and uplifting speaker. So um, uh, we're very thankful to have him back with us again uh, uh, today and through the rest of the week. Let me just give you a little bit of background because some of you might not have been here yesterday, but he's the lead pastor at Providence Church in Frisco, Texas. And before taking that uh, current role back in 2010, he spent over a decade traveling nationally and internationally, proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ in churches, retreats, camps, conferences, and missions. Afshin helped launch Vertical Bible Study at Baylor University. I know from experience that that was very, very well received and attended. He also partners with Elam Ministries and has traveled into the Middle East to train Iranian pastors. That is his own background as well. Uh, Afshin's passion is to teach the word of God as the authority and guide for life, to preach Jesus Christ as the only savior and redeemer of mankind, and to proclaim the love of Christ as the greatest treasure and hope in life. He and his wife, Meredith, currently reside in Frisco, Texas, along with their three children, Elise, Ansley, and Isaac. Let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll have uh, Pastor Ziafat come to us. Our Heavenly Father, we're here in your presence this morning, uh, thankful that you invite us into your presence, and that you were already here before we sat down, and you're here throughout this session, and as Jesus said, uh, I'll be with you even to the end of the age. So we're grateful for that. We take courage from the fact that even in the pressures of our studies, and I know that there, there are great pressures, and even among students here, and even students who felt they couldn't come today because they had to study, uh, I pray, Father, that uh, your grace would abound to them and lift them up and give them joy and peace in the middle of this uh, semester. And we do pray, Father, for uh, folks far distant from here over in the Florida panhandle who are getting the brunt of this hurricane right now. And we pray, Father, for the preservation of lives and property and uh, testimony, Heavenly Father. Uh, God, would you uh, encourage every family that's had to move and will be out of their homes for a period of time and not knowing what they're going to come back to. So, God, would you uh, show your strength and your power, which we do see in the storm, but we also see it in how you help people when they're suffering. So, God, now we pray that you administer to uh, Afshin and give to him, God, uh, an empowerment from your Holy Spirit uh, to speak uh, uh, powerfully into our hearts and lives. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Pastor Ziafat. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, amen. Um, I'm so uh, glad to be back. If you weren't uh, here yesterday, we uh, began speaking about just the, the power of the gospel to transform a people. And so, Yesterday we were in First Thessalonians chapter one, uh, and and we read there where Paul is is essentially telling the Thessalonians that I know that you didn't receive the gospel merely in word, but you received it in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. He's like I I know that that the gospel didn't go in one ear and out the other, all right? We talked about the parable of the sower, you know, and dropping the seed on rocky soil that didn't have root within itself, and so it didn't last. He's like, I know that's not you, essentially, is what he's saying. I know you really got the gospel, and the reason I know it is the rest of chapter one, where basically he says, you turned from idols to serve the living God, you became followers of us and of the Lord, through receiving the word and much affliction, so they, they continued, they went from being, uh, they repented, turned from idols to serve God, they became followers. In verse seven of chapter one of First Thessalonians says, you became examples for others to follow. And then verse eight says, the word of the Lord sounded forth from you. And so you see here, as we talk about missions and evangelism, how it all starts, it's all rooted with the gospel. That the God, he goes, I know you received the gospel the good news of Jesus Christ, 
not just in word, but in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. And so today what I want to do is I want to kind of focus in on the gospel being the sending gospel. Yesterday I talked about the call. The call isn't just to believe the right things mentally, but to actually deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow him. And yesterday my um, exhortation was essentially, man, lay your life down. Trust him and you're going to find life. And so today what I want to talk to you about is why you ought to lay your life down. What is, the, what is the compelling thing that causes you to lay your life down and trust him? And it is the gospel. The good news of Jesus Christ not only calls us to lay our life down, but to go. It is a sending gospel. And so if you would turn with me to Ephesians chapter two, go to Ephesians chapter two. I wanna go to one of my favorite passages ever to turn to, I'm sure. Um, most likely yours as well, uh, to preach or to show someone uh, the, the power of the gospel. And the reason I love Ephesians chapter two is because Paul begins with bad news and you really have to know if, we, if we're calling, if the gospel, the word gospel means good news, in order to know how good the good news is, you have to first know how bad the bad news is. And when you really get the bad news, then you understand how good the good news is. And I think that's why uh, he does this in Ephesians 2. And so today, really what I want to do, it, walking through Ephesians 2, we'll hit Ephesians 3 a little bit too, is give you three ideas. And the ideas are this, that, that when I t think of the sending gospel, that we have to remember, that, we have to, we, we, that, that it call, calls us to love, and then it calls us to go. All right, so I'm gonna start with the idea of remember. That's where he's gonna go in Ephesians 2, but let's lay out the gospel first. So first, the bad news, Ephesians 2, verse one. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, uh, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, <clears throat> carrying out the desires of the body and the mind and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. All right, so being a good uh, alliterative, alliter I can't even say that word, alliterative preacher, I'm gonna give you three Ds, all right? So here we go. He basically says you were dead, you were dominated essentially, and you were destined. Let me explain what I mean. You were dead, that's obviously clear, verse one. You were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. And let me just say, as a former Muslim, I, that was huge for me to grasp. The idea that we are dead in sin. Obviously, this goes all the way back to the very beginning when Adam and Eve were told not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And he said, in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. And then, of course, the enemy comes in and says, what did God say? He says, you're gonna die. No, you're not gonna die. He knows that if you eat from it, you'll become like him, knowing good and evil. So in essence, God is holding something back from you. You're missing out. He's trying to, but you, man, you can be God yourself. You can be like him. And so Adam and Eve took from the tree. That's the Bible, the Bible teaches us in Romans. That's where sin and death entered our human existence and has spread to all mankind so that every one of us is born dead spiritually. We're dead in sin. And this is huge to understand. You see, because he didn't say you were sick in your sin, right? A sick person can go take some medicine and go see a doctor, can do something for himself. A dead person can do nothing for himself. He needs someone to resurrect him, right? And so I think Paul is trying to drive home the, the, just the impossibility of our doing anything to save us from our own sins. You see, in Islam, uh, the teaching is that you're born sinless, clean slate, then throughout your life you do hopefully more good than bad, right? And then you're, they're gonna be weighed upon a scale at the, end, at, at the day of judgment, if you know anything about Islam. And so basically, if you understand what, a, what a, the Bible teaches. David says, in my mother's womb I was conceived in sin. So David, I mean, the Bible's clear, man, we are born in sin. And so, uh, this is so, I was reading a Muslim scholar once who said this, I liken the notion of Jesus to my sitting on a dock by the bay, no, he didn't say that. Anyone? <laughs> Two, three, four people? Okay, good. Sitting on a dock, you're with me, all right. Uh, sitting on a dock and a man running by telling me he loves me and then throwing himself in the water and drowning himself to prove his love for me. And he said, it's absurd. And I read that, I go, see? A Muslim that doesn't even have a concept of, of, of being born in sin and needing a savior. And so he thinks he's on the dock, he's fine. 
But a Christian understands not only that he is, and it's not only that we're in the water drowning, but Ephesians 2 is telling us, no, 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 you're at the very bottom of the water dead. You see it? So it's very important to understand you were dead in your sin. There's nothing you could do. On top of that, you were dominated. You were dominated by an enemy on the outside and an enemy within. You're following the course of this world, the prince of the power of the air. And 2 Corinthians teaches us that, that uh, the enemy of God is blinding the minds of unbelievers from seeing the light of the gospel. And so you have an enemy out in the world before Christ who is blinding you. His mission is to keep you from seeing the gospel. On top of that, you have an enemy within. You were, you were carrying out the desires of your flesh. By nature, you were, you were, you were enslaved to your f- flesh. So we say, man, Jesus came to set, set you free, but what does freedom look like? It's not, hey, I'm free to go do whatever I want. Actually, Jesus came to set you free from doing whatever you want. You were enslaved to your lusts and to your desires, to carrying out those lusts, and Jesus came to set you free from that, to do what he wants, which actually leads to life. So hear me, you gotta understand, man, he starts off, there is not, I mean, it's flat line, there is not a blip on the screen spiritually for you to even move to God. On top of that, even if there was a blip, you are dominated by your flesh with a bent to go away from God and do whatever you want. And then the the worst news may be, at the very end of verse three, he says, you are by nature children of wrath. That doesn't mean you're wrathful people, it means you're children destined for wrath. The truth is that Jesus didn't come into a neutral world, right? Or some became good, some became bad, and then, you know, no, he came into a world that was completely in rebellion against him destined for wrath. That's why John 3.17 says God didn't send his son into the world to judge the world, and we, you know, people are to condemn the world, and people read that and go, see, it's, it's not condemnation. Well, no, the reason he didn't come to condemn the world is because the world was already condemned, right? At the end of John 3, verse 35 and 36, it says, if, if anyone believes in the son, he has eternal life. If anyone does not believe in the son, he does not have eternal life, but the wrath of God remains on him. So everybody in this world is in two camps. They are still, they're, they're either still under the wrath of God, bearing down on them, or by God's grace alone, they have been removed from it, right? And so this is so important to understand. He's gonna go on to say that you were at once separated from God because of this. And this is what the Bible teaches us. When Adam and Eve sinned, they were removed from the garden. God puts a flaming sword at the edge of the garden as if to say, for mankind to come back into my presence, someone must fall under the sword. In other words, there must be a sacrifice for the remission of sin. And so this is, this is the bad news, and you got to get this bad news in order to be blown away by the good news. And the good news is the first two words of verse 4, and I think probably the two greatest words in the Bible. If you don't have these two words, we're doomed. But God, and that, is that beautiful? But God, being rich in mercy, listen, this is who he is, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and he raised us up with him and seated us up with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Paul is speaking about something in the future as if it's already happened, as if to say it's as good as done. You're already there. You are raised up with Christ, and the Bible teaches, obviously, through faith in Christ, for by grace you've been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing, it's a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So I I don't have time, You're, you're at seminary, I'm hoping you know the gospel, but man, horrible bad news, and incredible good news, but God, because of who he is because he's rich in mercy and because of his great love. But yet he needed to maintain his justice, Romans chapter three teaches us. And so he sent his son to pay the price for us. And at the cross, the justice and love of God meet. God is completely uh, just. In other words, our sins are paid to the full in the person of Christ on the cross, right? 
and because of his love we are saved. This is the good news. And so what does he say? Verse 11, therefore, remember, there's the word, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. So stop there, we'll continue. So he's saying, remember this. Remember, it's not because you were so smart and you figured it out. It's by God's grace that the things of God are only spiritually discerned. God has opened your eyes. You were dead. There's nothing you could do to even move towards him. Just do you understand the knowledge of the gospel that you have as a gift of grace? Uh, when we go to the Middle East and train these pastors, some of them, they leave Iran and go to a, this neighboring country that we work with them, and the reason they, they come here is ultimately their hope is that, uh, that uh, some of them, I, I shouldn't say all of them, some of them in the back of their mind they're thinking, what if this is my ticket to get to the West and get to America? Everybody wants to get to the West, get to America. And so they're there, they got this three month visa and they're thinking maybe I can get this you know, uh, full on visa and go on. And let me tell you when I know some people, uh, when, when I know that some of them, they really have got the gospel is when they do this. They get their passage, I've seen some of them, they got their visa, they're able to go to the West and they go, I can't. And they say this to me, Afshin, they say, Brother Afshin, I can't know what I know and not go back to Iran. They feel the weight of just the knowledge, the gift of the knowledge of the gospel. And they're like, I can't go to America and just get comfortable. I've got to go. And so what does that do for us? Remember. And I think we're a forgetful people, and we need to always remember. That's why in Philippians 2, he says, put others before yourself. Count others more significant than yourself. And he knows that none of us is going to ever do that. And so he says, have this mind in you, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was equal with God, emptied himself and came in the form of a bondservant and became obedient to God all the way to the point of the death of the, of the cross. So he's saying, I know you're never going to put somebody before yourself. Therefore, remember the one who emptied himself for you. So, so let, me, let, me, let me illustrate how important it is that the gospel, you've got to get this gospel. Okay. I'll illustrate it this way. How many of you have ever flown Southwest Airlines before? Anyone? Okay, Southwest Airlines, I think, is the one airline that doesn't assign you a specific seat. I think, anyways, right? And maybe there's others. And so they assign you like a letter and a number and you board in groups, right? A1 through 30, A31 through 60, B1 through 30, on and on, right? And the way you, you know, the first people that get on, obviously, they get, you know, you get to pick wherever you want to sit. And let me tell you, never has anyone gotten on there and said, you know what? I think I'm gonna go sit at the very back, right? And I'll sit next to the you know, toilet and I hope the door opens. And, you know, no one does that, right? Everyone, it's all about me. So the first people come on, they wanna sit at the very front of the plane, hopefully the aisle so I can put my stuff here and be the first one out, right? And hopefully no one will sit next to me. Okay, so A1 through 30 gets on and they go about you know, halfway down in the aisle seat, then that's a little too far, then they start filling in the window seat, but again, no one ever takes that middle seat, that's where you put your stuff there, right? And don't look at people as they pass by, right? And so that's how it works. And then by the time the C minus crew gets on, right, they're looking at a plane full of available middle seats, right? And listen, the way you get in the A1 through 30, you, you, you have to either pay extra or you have to at least get, get online and get your boarding pass right away or early. If you skate into the airport late, you're C minus, right? And so here's the deal. One time I was in the C minus crew and I was boarding this plane and I get on and uh, again, available middle seats, that's all we got. And the guy and his fa and father and son in front of me and the father had the audacity to ask the lady on the first row aisle Hey, do you mind, ma'am, sitting in that, the, the middle seat in the second row so I can sit here with my son? And she goes, oh. It was like everybody just like looked up like, oh. Like they didn't even say a word. Like the fa their faces, everyone on the first rows were like, who are you, Mr. C minus, right? You did nothing to get, and you're gonna come here and tell us to, and he goes, oh, never mind, he moved on. He, you know, and so I was like, that's so interesting to me. And I thought to myself, what if the way that lady got that ticket was completely different? And I'm not saying this could happen, but go with me. 
What if she got that ticket because she missed her previous flight actually and this flight was full and they said, sorry, the rest of the flights are full. And she's like, you don't understand. I have to get to my destination. And she's weeping and going, please let me on this plane. She's like, I'm sorry, ma'am, we're all full. And let's say somebody overhearing her just comes and says, you know what, she can have my ticket. Again, I'm not saying that could happen, but let's say that's how she got her ticket, right? Now, if that's how she got her ticket, and her father and son. Excuse me, ma'am, do you mind if I sit in the, your seat and you sit in the aisle and let me sit here with my my son, I'd be willing to bet she jumps off that seat and says, it's yours. Why? Because man, I'm on the plane. You see it? I don't even deserve to be on the plane. Do you see how when you take your eyes off of the gospel and you forget, entitlement sets in. But when you keep your eyes on what Jesus has done for you, remember, you were once cut off, separated, without hope. Then you're gonna put others before you. And so I say it has to start with the gospel. But then when you get the gospel, it'll cause you to love one another. So that's where he goes on, verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off, been brought near by the blood of Christ. He himself is our peace who has made us both one, has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace. And he might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to you who were near, for through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens of the saints, members of the household of God, and he goes on to say together, you are building the temple. So look at me really quickly, here's what he's saying. Because of the gospel too, Jew and Gentile, who used to hate one another and be at odds and be enemies of one another, are now actually members, or excuse me, fellow citizens, and it's almost as if he stops himself and he says, no, 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 it's actually even more intimate than that. They're family members. They're members of the household of God. And then he, uh, he stops and says, no, no, it's actually even more intimate than that. They are, if you will, bricks laying on top of each other, making up the temple of God. That dependent, that united to each other. You see how it's ramping up in its intimacy? He's trying to say, this is the astounding work of the gospel that, listen to me, friend, not only was the veil torn in two that separated us from a holy God, and now we can enter the presence of God, but then he says the dividing wall of hostility has come down, and everyone who read this would know what that means, right? In the temple courts, you know this, that there was actually a dividing wall that kept where the Gentiles could go to, and and the Gentiles couldn't pass beyond to where the Jews could go. In fact, there was an inscription that said, if anyone passes this point, any Gentile passes this point, he has himself to blame for his death. So Jesus is saying that here's what the gospel, excuse me, Paul is saying, this is what the gospel does. It reconciles you, it gives you peace with God because of his blood, the veil has been torn in two, but then the dividing wall has come down and two enemies are now one. This is powerful stuff. This is what, the, this is what our message is. Remember will drive you out and here's your message, your message is love. And this is what's gonna change the world, I'm telling you. I'll never forget being with my dad, who's a Muslim, and my uh, half-brother, who's a Muslim, having, this is many years ago, having dinner, and every time I look for opportunities to share the gospel with him. And sure enough, my brother tells me about wanting to get revenge. He was beaten up by some guys in high school. He was in high school. And he and his buddies were gonna get revenge. And so we start talking about, man, if you do this, you're gonna get in trouble. That's what my dad was saying. And I'm like, I don't care about that. I'm worried about your heart. And I said, bro, What if you were able to forgive him and it changed him forever and he was your best friend for the rest of your life, always at your service whenever you needed him? I'm not saying that would happen again, but which would you rather have? And he goes, I'll forget. I don't want to, don't talk to me about that stuff. And so my heart's just chasing the pounding because I've been praying that God would give me an opportunity to invite my dad to a movie that had just come out. And I said, you know, dad, um, you know, Mel Gibson, did you hear, just made a movie about the death of Jesus? And he said, yeah, I heard about that. And I go, do you wanna go see that? He's like, well, I got nothing going on. He looks at my brother, you got anything? He goes, no, I'm sure. 
And next thing you know, I'm driving in the car with my Muslim father and half-brother to go watch The Passion of Christ, right after this conversation about forgiving your enemies. And literally, he, imagine the end of the movie, I'm sitting between my dad and my brother, and Jesus stands and he says, you have heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say to you, love your enemy and bless those who persecute you. And I'm sitting between them just going, yes! <laughs> That's the message of the gospel. Now, Jesus goes on to say, if you, know, if you only love people who love you, what more do you do than the tax collectors? What more do you do than the world? If you're only gonna love people who deserve your love, hey, pat yourself on the back because you've just come up to the level of the world. But he's saying, I'm calling you to go beyond that and love people who don't deserve your love. And I say to you, you have not done anything uniquely Christian. Let me say it this way. In the matter of love, you have not done anything uniquely Christian until you love someone who doesn't deserve your love. You see it? And so this is what he's saying. So you remember, you love, and if you really get it, you go. If you really remember that you were cut off, but God stepped into our world in human flesh, he pursued us, he left this comfort zone, then you will go. And look at this in Ephesians 3. He goes on and talks about a mystery that the Gentiles are fellow heirs. And just look at verse 10 real quickly. He says, so that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. I love that. He's saying that word manifold means multifaceted like a diamond. In other words, he's saying this, that ultimately Gentiles are fellow heirs. In other words, as you know and you read scripture, the Bible, the God's heart beats for people from every tribe, tongue, and nation. And when those people are, are brought in as we go on mission and the church becomes multifaceted, if you will, many-faced, all right, people from every race and tongue, then that displays God's wisdom to the rulers in the heavenly places. They are blown away as they see that. And as you look at the scripture, I'm telling you the gospel is a sending gospel over and over again. God comes, go to, go to the Old Testament, God comes to Abraham. He says, leave your father, which I get. Right? Leave your father and your country and go to a land that I will show you. I'll make you a great nation, but eventually he says to him, yes, you're gonna have many descendants, as many as the stars are, but through you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. In other words, he says you're gonna have many descendants and then he points to the ultimate descendant. Through you, through Jesus, my blessing will reach all the nations. And then Jesus in John 10, he says, I'm the good shepherd, I lay my life down for the sheep. But then what, he say, what does he say? But I have sheep that are not of this fold, and I must draw them also, so that there will be one flock and one shepherd. What is he saying? Same thing to Abraham. Abraham, you're gonna be a great nation, but it's not just about you. It threw you all the families. What does he say in John 10? I'm the good sheep, but you're not the only ones in the flock. Go out. I have other sheep and other flocks. Draw, call them in. And over and over again, then in Acts chapter 10, Peter has that vision of that sheet coming down with all kinds of animals, both clean and unclean. And he hears, take, kill, and eat. And he says, I will not touch what is common and unclean. And God says, don't call what I have made common and unclean. And right then, there's a rap at the door. And a Gentile man named Cornelius, who's had a vision, calls for Peter. And as you know, Peter goes and he preaches the gospel. Listen to me. Talk about getting uncomfortable. Abraham, leave your country, right? Peter, walking into a Gentile man's home, unclean people, for him, for his mindset. And he preaches the gospel. They receive the, the Holy Spirit. He baptizes them. And he goes back, and you know the story, and the good Christians back at the base camp in Jerusalem rebuke him for what he did. How dare you preach the gospel to the Gentiles? And one of my favorite parts of scripture is when he says, look, if they receive the Holy Spirit in the same manner that we did, who am I to stand in God's way? And the Bible says the church fell silent and they glorified God because they understood the message of the gospel was not just for the Jew, but for the Gentile. And so I'm telling you, if you get the gospel, if you really remember it, entitlement goes out, you'll put others before yourself, 
You'll seek to walk in love, to love those who have harmed you even, not condoning what they've done, but loving them, and your, your, your heart will be to go, to get uncomfortable. And, and, I, and I'm gonna close with this. I just don't know if in America, we in the church have remembered that's why we're here. It's not for our comfort, it's in fact for us to get uncomfortable and go. And what's amazing to me is now we don't have to go, they're coming here. And what do we do? Well, a couple of instances and I'll be done. Two quick stories, I promise. I think, here we go. The first one, the good, I'm, I'm still a little under uh, before my, my cutoff. I think I'll hit it, just stay with me. <laughs> Farmersville, Texas, I'm not trying to throw the whole community under the bus, but there are some people in Farmersville, just northeast of us, that were up in arms because the Islamic Association of Collin County wanted to build a cemetery there. And they said, and a pastor stood up and said, we can't let this happen. If they build this cemetery, more Muslims will come to our area. And I'm like, why are you a pastor? Because a pastor ought to stand up and say, I got great news, church. The Islamic Association is building a cemetery in our backyard and maybe more Muslims will come to our area and we can actually fulfill our calling. And so one broken-hearted pastor called for a town hall meeting and they invited me to come in and share my story. And I don't have time, that's another story. But let's move on. The second instance I wanna tell you is of course the Syrian refugee crisis. And that happened obviously three years ago, it really became big and I'm not gonna go into all the politics of it, don't worry, okay? I'm not here to make any kind of political statement but obviously there was all kinds of should we close the borders or not, blah, blah, blah. And I was invited to go to Washington DC and sit on Capitol Hill on a panel with the president of uh, ERLC, the uh, World Relief uh, spokesperson, someone from our State Department, and then Afshin Ziafat, <laughs> Iranian American <laughs> pastor in Frisco, Texas. I was like, why am I, why am I here? But anyways, and the, the whole deal was give a Christian response to the refugee crisis, and here's what I said. I said, look, I want my government to protect me. As an American citizen, I believe that's their role. They, the, the man, they, they, they're there to to protect us, and I, I think they should do whatever they can to make sure no bad guys get in, for sure. And I said, but as a Christian, I can't be consumed with safety over all. And I said, so I'm not, again, I'm gonna let them decide what they're gonna do with the borders. I'm thankful I'm not in politics. But if a, a refugee were to come to my area, am I gonna board up my windows when I clap for people who are going overseas? to put themselves in harm's way to spread the gospel? And I said, no, I can't, because I can't be driven by fear. And that's not my call. And so I tell a story about how we came over here in the late 70s, and the part I didn't tell you yesterday is not only did we flee the Islamic Revolution, we came here from Iran thinking that it was gonna be easy here, but then guess what? A bunch of Americans were held hostage in Iran for a year, and the Iran hostage crisis hit, and guess what happened? People threw rocks through our window in Houston. My parents' car's tires were slashed. Older high school kids threatened to beat up my brother and I because they found out we were from Iran. And I'm telling this story here on Capitol Hill and I'm saying, look, I get what it's like being from some place where people are very skeptical of. But I'm so thankful that one Christian tutor looked at me and looked at my family and didn't see threat but saw opportunity. Yeah. And she loved me and she taught me English, and because it came from her, had any other American given me that New Testament, I would have thrown it away. But since it came from her, I held on to it. And today I'm a pastor, spreading the gospel because of her. And so I'm telling you, Acts 20, Peter, Paul is going to Jerusalem and he tells the Ephesian elders, I know affliction and suffering await me, imprisonment await me. And he, almost as if he knows they're gonna be thinking, well then why are you going? He says, but I do not count my life of any value nor as precious to myself, but only that I finish the course of the ministry God has given me. In other words, he's saying, I have something more important to me than even my life, and it's the mission God has given me. So, yes, I want safety, but safety doesn't trump everything. Yes, I want comfort, but comfort doesn't trump everything. 
mission is what drives me, all right? The goal of a Christian is not to extend his days by any means possible, but to spend every one of his days fulfilling the mission God has given him, all right? So let's pray. Lord, we love you. God, we thank you for the power of the gospel. We thank you that you clearly lay it out in scripture for us so that we would not forget. And the gospel is not just something for unbelievers to hear, but for us to hear over and over again, to be astounded that entitlement would go out, that we would sacrificially love people who don't even deserve our love. Even like that second grade tutor did for me. And that we would be willing to get uncomfortable and go. I pray for the hearts of students here. I pray, Jesus, as you're calling them to go, that they would be obedient and that they would trust you and that they would never forget the gospel. And I pray that for myself as well. In Christ's name we pray, amen.